Hello, I'm Michael Gaucher, and I am developing a software application called an RSS reader using .NET C Sharp on an Intel Pentium processor and four gigabytes of RAM. And the question through this process is, how well can you do software development in a low-end computer environment in 2022? And what does that look like from the standpoint of visual tools, such as Microsoft Visual Studio, in a Windows 11 environment using Microsoft SQL Server, right? And so in this process, we are going to access SQL Server on a low-end PC. And when I say access SQL Server, it's not like the other video titled Intel Pentium and SQL Server, where we set up SQL Server and we just see if it launches and how well does it launch. How well does it open as a program? Uh, actually, we're talking about Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio in that case. How well does that open on a low-end computer? In this case, what does it look like in terms of actually accessing the data, right? Is it impossible? Is it excruciatingly slow? Is it so slow that you might as well not waste your time? And so, before we get to that conclusion, you know, we want to take the necessary steps the same way we would on a quote unquote mid-level or high-end computer. And that starts with setting up a database in SQL Server. So we're going to use the visual tools, SQL Server Management Studio, and create a database, create tables, tables in this case, that will mirror the tables that exist in the SQL Lite version of the database. And we're going to create stored procedures. And so the conversion program that we have built so far, it runs on the command line. And Visual Studio automates the invocation of the command line and the running of the program. And then when the program runs, it executes software instructions that looks for the data in SQLite, brings that data into memory through C Sharp in a .NET program, and then posts that data into an SQL Server database, right? And along the way, there's going to be a bit of revision and refactoring of this program until this data conversion is right because the success of the graphical user interface program depends on accurate data all the data and us understanding how the data works from a mechanical standpoint right what are the mechanics of the data like what's the shape of the data and what are going to be some successful access methods for interacting with the data? In the previous video, we had laid the groundwork for transforming data from SQLite to SQL Server, but we hadn't yet put the pieces in place to import data into an SQL Server database. And what we need is a SQL Server database. And one of the ways we can do that on Windows is to launch a tool called SQL Server Management Studio. The tool in this case is taking about two to three minutes to launch. And I know that if you're on a system with an Intel Core i5 or Intel Core i7 or greater, uh, preferably the G series or H series of those processors, then you will see much better performance in terms of loading this tool right than you see here where we're on a system with an Intel Pentium processor with four gigabytes of RAM. So prior to this, we saw great performance out of our tools, given that we optimized the Windows environment and we um, 
were using tools that didn't put so much demand on the system. But this tool in particular puts such a load on the system that we do not see the quick performance that we see out of the other tools on a low-end system, which is fine. That's what we're here to do is to see how this process unfolds on a low-end computer. At the same time, it's not like it takes an hour for the tool to load. It does eventually load. So the first thing that we want to do is log into the server, that SQL server, and take a look at our databases. So we are able to log in, and login doesn't take an inordinate amount of time. And we're going to expand the databases node so that we can see how many databases and what databases we have. Well, here I see we have four databases. And the one that I am highlighting is one that I created in the video titled Intel Pentium and SQL Server. And I'm going to delete that database. And this will show us what um, database deletion looks like on a system with an Intel Pentium processor. I expect the process not to take too long. And so uh, deleting a database is a relatively simple process, or it can be. Now on a production system or in a production environment, the case may be different. But when you're working on your local machine, um, that's, it's a it can be a pretty straightforward um, uh, process. So now we we'll want to create a database, and this database is going to house the RSS feed data. And so the dialogues look similar between deleting a database and creating one, but when creating one, we need to give it a name. We need to give the database that we want to create a name. And I'm going to call this RSS underscore data. The uh, name need not be too creative, of course, in a, um, a regular professional environment, you want to really put heavy thought into what you name your databases. That's extremely important. And so we don't have any tables that we have created yet. And I thought about creating the tables visually, but I decided to script that um, using SQL. And so I'm going to open up a what's called a query window, a new query window in SQL Server Management Studio. And to get a sense of what the schema for our tables uh, should be like, I'm going to hop over to SQLite. Um, I'm going to open up a command prompt, and this command prompt is going to allow me to navigate into the RSS databases that I um, migrated over from the Linux environment. And this will allow me to run a command in SQLite that will give me the schemas for all the tables. And I see I have the schema for the uh, feeds table, and I'm going to paste that uh, schema into the query window over in SQL Server Management Studio. The SQL syntax for creating a table uh, between SQL uh, Lite and SQL Server is very similar but the SQL dialect in SQL Server, which is Transact SQL, it has some peculiarities to it compared to SQLite. So using uh, find and replace, I'm going to transform the uh, SQL uh, to one that's more suitable for SQL Server. And I'm going to use the nvarcar uh, data type on the columns to facilitate um, easy uh, insertion of string data that have varying um, you know, sizes to them. And so I'm going to do the same process for feeds article. This is where all of our article content will go. And I'm going to change the uh, default um, for the row insert date time column so that we use the syntax more suitable for SQL Server. So I'm going to use the get date function um, which is um, the, a function recognized by SQL Server, and that will allow um, for uh, a date timestamp 
to uh, accompany each row um, that is inserted into the database. And so um, you'll see that um, it's still defined as date time now, which is recognized by SQL Lite, but I want to select that text and I want to, um, I first I want to um, just see what um, get date is going to return. So I just do an inline select and then I can delete the select part and just um, have a get date, which uh, when I execute this um, definition now puts the feeds article uh, table into the database. So now it's time to transition over to Visual Studio and make use of these tables that has been defined. And so in Visual Studio, um, we're going to um, expand the code because right now what it does is it reads each RSS database and it extracts out the uh, the data from that database and puts it puts that data temporarily into the program's memory. And so what we want to do is move the data from the program's memory into an SQL Server database. The process of importing data from an SQL-like database into an SQL Server database is mediated through software code. And so far the software code is defined to loop through or access each RSS database and bring the data from that database into program memory. Once the data is in program memory, the data would then be accessed from program memory and placed into an SQL Server database. The method we choose for doing that in software code is a for loop or a variation of that, um, a for each loop. And so I am setting up the pseudocode, so to speak, or the prototype for that, in which I will loop through each feed, each feed definition. So the feed definitions establish what's the name of an RSS feed and what um, website or network URI, Uniform Resource Indicator, or we can also go with Uniform Resource Locator, and that's the network endpoint where our data will reside. And so we set that up and we also will um, access each feed article, right? Each headline and its associated um, detailed content. And so that's the process um, that, we, um, that we want to put in place. And then the details of that is to access each data element, each field for the feed and for the article and put those uh, those feed values or those field values into uh, the feed table and the feed articles table respectively. And so we basically have a for loop and a nested for loop and the nested for loop is going to be driven off of the a parent for loop. And so for each RSS feed we want the corresponding RSS feed article that will allow us to basically step through the feed articles in the sequence um, corresponding to the RSS feed. And so putting this in place is not very difficult at all. It's, it's very straightforward. Um, the structure and the sequence is very clear in our minds, and that's the important part. Now, it's, it's just like when you're trying to uh, state something verbally. The thought may be very clear in your head, right? 
but it doesn't always come out clear through your words. And it's the same way when you're writing software code. The process may be supremely clear in your mind, but it may not always translate clearly when you write code. And so, as much as I understood this process, and I have been doing processes like this for two decades, I still have to work on that when actually putting it in code. Fortunately, experience is a great guide for me and allows me to move through this with greater proficiency than, let, than I did, let's say, in uh, 2004 or even 2006, let's say. And so, in the year 2022, I am doing this with much greater uh, proficiency uh, than I ever have before, even after taking um, several years break from uh, writing code of any kind. And so, um, so the process is now in place, and or at least the the main um, uh, uh, sequence structure, the sequence structure is in place, right? So the main code sequence is in place to get us where we want. So now um, we need the uh, connecting part. So um, we need to be able to connect to the database. And the way you do that with SQL Server uh, can take a couple of forms. Um, the way I'm going to do it is with a connection string and using the settings um, approach in Visual Studio in this .NET project. Um, I can basically define a setting that has a type of that has a type defined as connection string, and what that will do is it allow me to conveniently define that connection visually, rather than define all the particulars and have to remember all the particulars of the connection string syntax. So here I can choose SQL Server as the uh, database that I'm going to connect to and then uh, click the three ellipses off to the right which will bring up this dialogue test my connection and voila just like that I have a connection string that's properly formatted and in this case I used Windows authentication no point um, on this local machine where this actual software is not going to go into a server uh, defining an SQL um, uh, server um, user rather than um, using integrated Windows security. And so um, that connection is now um, defined and so now what we need is a way to um, so now that we're connected to the SQL Server database we need a means of putting data into the SQL uh, Server database through that connection. And the means that I chose to do that is not through dynamic SQL embedded in the program, I decided to do that through stored procedures. And so I'm going to write a stored procedure, um, one for uh, the feeds and one for the feeds articles, right? And I'm going to use a little trick in um, SQL uh, Server Management Studio where I can script an insert statement, right? Uh, very useful. And then I can use um, copy, I'm sorry, uh, find and replace to replace uh, these, uh, these parameters into their proper store procedure uh, syntax. And so, very convenient way to get uh, store procedures up and running. And of course, you can refine the store procedures um, you know, beyond that, where you can put in um, you know, um, evaluation structures, right? where you can um, determine whether you should be doing an insert or an update based on the existence of data and it's a very very uh, smooth way to um, define your store procedures but I went with a more basic store procedure definition uh, in this case 
and um, let's expand the store procedures node and you can see that there's the store procedure that was defined you can even right click on these and say uh, choose modify and it will generate the appropriate uh, modification SQL so that you can make changes to the store procedures and you know you can do that all day long in a uh, a professional um, software development environment you know in a workplace or otherwise and it's a it's a very effective way to manage uh, tables and store procedures and views um, I did not use views in this particular process but uh, views are a great complement to store procedures um, you can achieve uh, a great many things with hierarchical views. Um, I've used hierarchical views um, extensively uh, in conjunction with store procedures and they've uh, been uh, invaluable for uh, getting data through uh, from an application into a database. Here I use the parse uh, feature in SQL Management Studio to parse the SQL for the insert feeds article store procedure and um, there are a few things that need to be corrected. Um, needed an underscore between the word insert and feeds article for the store procedure name and so that was easily corrected and then uh, to use uh, find and replace on the parameter so that you know it's properly defined so now that we know we have the store procedures in place right we can now use those store procedures in code so I have the functions already defined um, at, on the software side and now all I have to do is just put in the code to uh, bind the software to the store procedures and so um, we are there at this point in terms of that um, and so I'm going to basically have that um, process driven off of the data itself so um, I got the column names for the um, for the feeds data and the column names for the feeds articles and I use that to define the per store procedure parameter objects in the C sharp code right and you can see this code on github for this project where you can see how I went about dynamically defining the parameters uh, for each store procedure and relating that to the actual uh, object instances so let's run this uh, program because at this point the program, the ETL program is done. So let's run this program and see what the result is. And so um, no errors at this point. Well, obviously this is a polished video, so to speak. It's kind of polished, but um, there were some errors. But I dealt with those errors and everything is running smooth. Um, just keep in mind this particular development uh, process uh, it took me about four hours, but um, once I uh, got through that, um, this is the final result. And so we have the data in the respective tables, and um, everything is looking good on this end. We have data for the feeds. We have data for the feeds articles. And the number of rows for feeds articles is in line with what we would expect. Um, we've ex we've excised duplicates in this process, and we um, have everything we need so that the user interface program that we're going to develop is going to have data to access and present on the screen.